Thanks. Um, okay, cool. I get to do the fun stuff. I, I don't know if you get to go now or not. You don't have to stay up here, but you can just quietly back out. Pat's also going on the trip, so make sure you say thanks to him as well. Um, cool. So uh, in light of the fact that we're in Ruth, um, and Ruth and Naomi at various points were foreigners in uh, a land that wasn't their own, we're going to play a little game to see which of us would be best prepped, maybe, to be able to go to a foreign land, uh, and which of us are kind of stuck in our American ways, I guess. Um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to play two rounds. Uh, first round is going to be for adults. Second round will be for kids. So if you are 18 years or older, I need you to stand up. That's everybody. The adults are so shy to do this. Go ahead. If you're 18 or older, everybody up. I can spot from here if you're lying to me, just FYI, right? Yeah, so you're slow to get up. I get it. Um, okay, so simple enough game. All I'm going to do, require of you, is that you just be honest, okay? So if I make a statement and it applies to you, you're going to sit down and you're out of the game, okay? We're going to see who the last person standing is. Last person gets a prize. The prize, Jess has got it. What is it? Something awesome. Oh, Chick-fil-A gift card. You can't go wrong with that. That sounds fantastic. Some of you are like, oh, now I'm in. I'm in. Game time. Let's do this thing. All right. So first and foremost, um, you are going to sit down if, so again, these are things that are common to maybe America and Americans and maybe not so common in other countries. So if you have ever lived in a fraternity or sorority house, you're going to sit down. So you have to be honest. Anyone who's ever lived in a fraternity or a sorority? I got nobody? Wow. Well, no, oh, we got one down. Sorry. Uh, that's not a knock on you. It's just something that's, you know, <laughs> common to Americans, I guess. All right. Number two. If you have three or more bumper stickers on any of your vehicles, you're going to go ahead and sit down. Three or more bumper stickers. Couple down, <laughs> one slowly, like I don't want to admit to this, but yeah, that, that was me. <laughs> All right, good, okay. Next, if you have an American flag up somewhere in your home or on your vehicle flying, you're gonna go ahead and sit down. We are very patriotic, which is a good thing, but maybe not as common to walk down the street and see 100 flags flying, so that took down a good bit. All right, next, if you ever ever eaten some kind of a supersized meal or extra large drink that's like crazy big, you know, you get the biggest thing you could possibly get, uh, you're going to go ahead and sit on that. Thanks for your honesty, everybody. <laughs> Very reluctant sitters, but we got it. Good job. All right, we have a few left. Here we go. Next. Okay. If you have ever worn like pajamas or sweatpants out to somewhere public, like a store, a grocery store, like your, you know, stuff you would wear to bed, but you're wearing it out in public. That is a very American thing to do. I don't think I've ever seen my father wear anything that is not proper out. All right. Got, ooh, getting down to it. Okay. If you have ever eaten a deep fried Oreo or ice cream, we love to deep fry things that shouldn't be deep fried in America. A couple, a couple of you sit. Thank you for your honesty. I appreciate that. We have one, two, three, four, five left is what I see. Five. Okay. So next, if you own, we're very big into college sports. If you own a college t-shirt of somewhere you didn't attend, sit down. So if you, you know, got an Alabama shirt and you didn't go to Alabama, you're going to have to sit down. I'm looking at you. All right, <laughs> we have four left. All right, if you've ever eaten at a sit-down restaurant of some sort, doesn't have to be a long sit-down, after 12 a.m., so we have 24-hour joints a lot here in the States, which is not very common everywhere else. No, none of you. Okay, let's move on to the next one. This one might knock out some people. If you drink coffee more often on the go than you do sitting down and having it so like, you have coffee to go. I see a coffee cup in your hands, sir. I'm just saying. Uh, so it is a very American thing to drink coffee on the go instead of sitting at the restaurant and sipping on it and hanging out and talking. All three of you? Hmm, I don't know about that. There's four? Where's the fourth? Oh, right there. Sorry. It's light really bright in my eye. Okay. Um, 
if you prefer ice in your water, instead of just drinking it lukewarm or tepid, sit down. Thank you for your honesty. You were so close. Two left? Okay. Man, I'm going to have to have a tiebreaker here. All right, hold on. Uh, let me pull this up. I have some tiebreaker. Hold on. Okay. So, if, let's see which one I want to pick. Let's do, what's that? I only got one gift card. How, what am I supposed to do? Have them wrestle for it? <laughs> Quick arm wrestle, ready? No, I'm just kidding. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, if you are a person who is usually habitually late, even a few minutes, and you're more late than not, look at, the, look at my spouse. Uh, am I late? Am I, no? <laughs> Neither of you is late? Okay. He, oh, he, he fixed you of that. Good, okay. All right, so we're just going to do it nice and simple. We're going to rock, paper, scissor for this thing. All right? Best out of three. Can you see each other? <laughs> Ooh, she's, trying to, she's really trying to win this thing. All right, are you ready? You got to look. Do you know how to rock, paper, scissor? Yeah. Yeah, it's rock, paper, scissor, and shoot, right? So help her out. It's a complicated game. All right, you ready? I'll say it out loud. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. I have no idea who has what. Rock and paper. Paper wins on that one. Good. One for you. Ready? Had who had scissors? You had scissors? Oh, sorry. Scissors won. One to her. Okay, ready? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Rock. It's a rock and what? Paper. Paper wins that one. Ooh, one to one. All right, next one wins. Ready? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Scissor and scissor. Ty, keep going. Ready? <laughs> rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Rock and Right, well, come on! All right, ready? You guys get, would get along great. You think alike. Ready? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. What is that? Scissor, rock, rock wins. All right. Prize goes there. You might be best suited in a foreign country, just FYI. Also, maybe share that. Like, take her out to lunch. You got a gift card now. You guys could be friends. Okay. All right, kids, you ready? It's your turn to do this game. All right, if you are 17 or younger, stand up. 17 or younger, stand on up. That counts. 11 is under 17. <laughs> All right, you guys are ready? Okay. So you are going to sit down if you are normally allowed or it's okay to wear shoes in your house. Sometimes a very American thing. I was not allowed to wear shoes in the house. My kids are not really allowed to wear shoes in the house, honestly. So if you're allowed to, if it's okay for you to wear shoes in the house, you got to sit down. Parents, you can help your kids out with this, and whether they're sure or not sure about these things. Okay. Um, next one. We have a large obsession with toys in this country. If you have 15 or more stuffed animals, 15 or more, that's a lot of stuffed animals, if you have 15 or more stuffed animals, you gotta sit. You gotta listen to your moms and dads. They know. They know how many stuffed animals you have. Yes, thank you, Quinn, for your honesty. You have more than 15 stuffed animals. You have like a ton. Yeah, you guys have way too many toys, I know. All right. You have 15? You gotta sit down, girl. Sorry. All right, next one. Um, we have much earlier bedtimes here in America than in a lot of places. Um, so if your bedtime is any time before 8 p.m., so 8 or earlier, you got to sit down. Ooh, during school or not. Uh, during school? During school, my wife says. So if your bedtime is before 8 o'clock during school, you got to sit down. If it's after 8, you're good. So, okay, we got a couple. That back row, I see a lot of people up there. All right, next one. Roman's still up. All right. Yay, Roman. All right. Uh, if you have, in your family, we have, in America, we drive very large vehicles. If you have an SUV or a car with five, more than five seats in your family, not you, obviously you don't drive, but in your family, if you have an SUV or a car with more than five seats, sit down. <laughs> Jack's got 10 seats in his car. Just kidding. All right. 
We have, oh gosh, that light's bright. One in the back. Anyone else? No. Is there just one left? Is there anyone else standing? No? Where? Are you standing? Oh, no. Oh, you thought you did, but you don't. Okay, all right. So we got two left. It's between you two. Ready? Next one. Okay. Um, this one, I'm not sure you'll be able to answer. Maybe mom and dad might know. Um, if you ever used anything other than a disposable, oh, sorry, if you only used disposable diapers, you would sit down. If you've only ever, this was when you were a baby, obviously, I hope. You're not, you guys are way too old to be wearing diapers. Uh, if you only use disposable. No, neither of you? Okay, all right. Next one. Um, if you ever had, we have a big thing with birthday parties. If you ever had a themed birthday party, themed birthday party, sit down. Neither of you? Okay, we'll move on to the next one. Ready? Um, if you've ever eaten a Happy Meal, we have a big thing with McDonald's. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. No Happy Meal for you? Congratulations. I think you're the victor. All right, we got a prize for you. Cruz is running it up to you. Nice. All right, you might also be best suited to visit a foreign land and not be too estranged. So congratulations. Thanks for playing along with us. That's all I got. I'm going to hand it off to Miss Shaney, and peace. Hello, everyone. I'm Shaney. I am the family's pastor here at 704 Church. And this is awesome. I love these lights because I really can't see your faces, which helps with my nervousness. Um, I don't do this very often. Um, I pass it off as much as I can, but I really felt like God put a word on my heart. So if we can start off with prayer so I can prepare my heart. Lord, I just thank you so much for today. I thank you for seeing all of these kids up here and the way they love to worship you. Lord, I pray that you would just, my words would be your words, and that you would help me to be clear and concise, and that, um, that you would use me. And I pray all these things in your name. Amen. So today, I am going to uh, talk to you about the book of Ruth. Um, I, th I think when I talked to Thad about it a little bit, he was like, oh, I've never preached on that. And I was like, oh, maybe you should. It's a really good book. Um, so I'm going to kind of paraphrase a little bit about the book of Ruth. So in the beginning of the story, it starts off with um, tragedy. So there's famine in the land. So Naomi and her family, they decide we need to get out of here. There's not enough food. So they go to Moab. And the Moabites are historically, they're known as enemies of the Israelites. Um, so it's kind of weird that they went there. But when you look at it geographically, there, uh, the region was a green valley in the middle of a like serious desert. Um, once they move there, Naomi's husband dies, her two sons die after they've married Moabite women, Ruth and Orpah. The famine passes, and Naomi hears that, and she's like, all right, got to get back home. I'm done living in this land. And Ruth and Orpah decide, okay, great, we're going to go with you. And she's like, hmm. Let, let me kind of prepare you for what you're going to be set up for here. So first of all, if you, you should probably just go back to your moms. Go live with them because then you have a chance of, like, getting married again. Because if you come with me, you guys are Moabite women. Nobody's going to marry you. And I'm not having any more sons because I'm too old. So I, they're not going to be able to have that. Um, she also says that, you know, it's going to be a really difficult life. Because you're a woman, you're going to be poor, you're a foreigner, and so they kind of have all these things stacked up against them. Um, and also, they're going to have to take care of Naomi, who is feeling hopeless at this point, very bitter. In fact, she feels so bitter that she actually changes her name to Mara, which means bitter. So yes, a bitter mother-in-law. Yeah, that sounds like fun. Um, so they also have this really difficult road ahead of them to get back to Bethlehem. It's a 50-mile strip of land, and it's very rugged and steep, and it would have taken them probably seven to 10 days on foot. Uh, I think we have a slide to show the land. 
So they were walking through the rocks, mountain climbing, doing some uh, difficult, and there are two women on this road, or then the, and there are women on this road because, you know, it, might, it probably was not a safe journey. So at this point, Orp is like, Psst, I'm out. Thank you very much. I'm going to go back home. And Ruth's reply is this. So I want you to look at Ruth 1, 16 through uh, 17. But Ruth replied, don't try to make me leave you and go back. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I'll die. And there my body will be buried. I won't let anything except death separate you from me. And if I do, may the Lord punish me greatly. That's a pretty bold statement right there. She's going, I'm willing to take this on to the point of death. It's like, okay. So you have Ruth here. She's, you know, she's got all these challenges. She's a Moabite. She's a widow. She's poor. She's a woman. She's taking care of Naomi, who's bitter and hopeless. Seems kind of like a crazy idea. She's, you know, basically in all this, you hear her saying to herself, I'm not good enough. I'm a Moabite. But I can't be used by God. But I'm, I'm still going to try this. I'm going I'm to try. So I want to tell you a little story about... Uh, my husband and I, when we moved here, uh, we moved here about three years ago from Florida. And the people in Florida kind of thought we were crazy for doing what we did because we came here and we didn't have any jobs. We picked this old abandoned house that had been abandoned for 12 years that was <laughs> run down to the point of it. Maybe it needed just to be demolished, but we decided we saw the vision of how it could be. Um, and if you know anything about my husband, he, he's, um, he's kind of one of those that are a little on the safe side. So the fact that he was on board with this and was like, yeah, we need to move before I was even on board with it. And I was like, mm, let, let's keep praying about it. Okay, God, God, you know, and I had my list of things. God, if you really want me to do this, then you got to give me all these signs. And, and he was on board with it. And it just kind of like, in reflecting in the story, I was like, man, God just like paved the way for us to be here. And we came here and, you know, God just every step of the way has provided every need that we've needed. Um, he brought us to this church, doing what I never thought I would be doing up here. But uh, again, like I said, he, uh, we had faith and we said, okay, we, we can do this. Um, so once they all get to Bethlehem, Ruth goes right off to work. She, uh, the only work that she could do as someone who was a foreigner and poor and a widow was to walk behind the people who were collecting grain and pick up basically the leftovers that they dropped. Not a super glamorous job. Out in the heat, basically just picking up somebody's leftovers. Again, she's kind of feeling that like, I'm not good enough to do much more than this. Um, so it just so happens, it says that actually in the Bible, it just so happens that she is picking up grain in Boaz's field. I love that because nothing just so happens with God, right? So Boaz sees her and he's like, hmm, who's that? And his head servant is like, hey, wait, she's a Moabite. She's not good enough. You know, she came here with, you know, with Naomi, but, like, she's a Moabite. That's his first words. I was like, okay. So and he approaches her, and he tells her, you know, look, please, you're welcome to continue working in this field. And she responds to him, do, do you know that I'm a Moabite? Do you know I'm not really good enough to be here? And this is his reply to her. So we're going to look at Ruth 2, 11 through 13. Boaz replied, I've been told all about you. I've heard about everything you have done for your mother-in-law since your husband died. I know that you left your father and mother. I know that you left your country. You came to live with people you didn't know before. May the Lord reward you for what you have done. May the Lord, the God of Israel, bless you richly. You came to him to find safety under his care. Ruth replies to him, Sir, I, I hope you will continue to be kind to me, Ruth said. You have made me feel safe. You have spoken to me kindly. And I'm not even as important as one of your servants. 
She knew her pecking order. She knew she wasn't good enough. She knew that God could never use her. She, this is, you know, she's at the bottom of the barrel here. So Boaz instructs his servants. He's like, you know, look, leave a little extra grain, pull some of those extra sheaves out there and drop them on purpose, help her out a little bit. So Ruth goes home and Naomi sees that she has picked up a ton of grain. And she's like, hmm, that, that's a lot. You worked really hard today. Where did you get grain today? And Ruth tells her, oh, I was at Boaz's field. And this is where the shift happens for Naomi. She goes from being this bitter, hopeless person because she's lost everything dear to her to, oh, Boaz. See, Boaz is their, one of their family redeemers or protectors. He's a close relative of um, Elimelech, her husband, of Naomi's husband. He had the opportunity or the choice, if he wanted to, to buy Naomi's land and potentially to marry Ruth so that the family name could continue. So she knows this, and she's like, ah, here it is. I'm going to come up with a plan. So she starts scheming, and she comes up with this plan for Ruth, and Ruth is like, okay, uh, you need to go get showered because you smell. You need to put on your nicest clothes, put some perfume on, and then you're going to go back over to Boaz. You're going to go to where he's uh, at the threshing floor, at the you know, separating out the grain, and you're going to wait. Don't let him see you. Wait till after he's eaten and is in a good mood. Ladies, it says it in the Bible, okay? When you want something from your husband, make sure your timing is perfect. Anyway, so he goes off. He eats. He gets into his, you know, gets, lays down, and he and he's, falls asleep. And Ruth goes over to his feet, uncovers his feet, and lays down by his feet. Something just wakes him up, and he looks down, and he's startled. And he goes, who, who is that? And she's like, it's me. It's Ruth. It's Ruth. And she says, let me get to this. Yes, she says, hey, it's me, Ruth. You're one of my family protectors, and I want you to marry me. I don't want, she doesn't ask to make, don't make me your servant, don't make me your concubine, don't make me anything less. I want to be your wife. So I think it's traditionally, even nowadays, that the husband asks the wife, but even back then, it was probably very unlikely that a woman would ask a man to marry them. But she's definitely being, she knows this is her, her one choice. And quite honestly, in my opinion, if I read between the lines, I feel like she probably really liked Boaz because he was very kind to her. So she knew that he would be a good husband for her. So she obviously feels confident enough at this point. She sees that he's spoken some, some truth into her about who she really is. And so she asks him to marry her. And he does what every woman wants their husband to do. And she, he says, I'm going to do this right away. Don't worry. Everything you said, I'm going to get this all worked out. You don't worry. Go back home. Go to your mother. Oh, here, here's some food, by the way. Don't go empty-handed. Go back home, and I'm going to take care of this. And I'll let you know when I got it all taken care of. And she was like, okay. So she leaves. She goes back home, and she sits and waits. Well, Boaz goes, and he gets it all arranged. They get married, and they have a baby. And their son was named Obed. So because we are in... We have kids in the room. I'm going to condense this down super fast, but I really want you to get challenged today. This is for you kids. I want all the kids out there to listen because you're about to start school, right? I'm sorry. I said the S word, school. But you're about to start school, and you're going to hear some things from people. Maybe people are going to say things to you like, you're no good at soccer, or you're stupid. Or you're awkward or you're weird. Maybe you even think those things maybe a little bit about yourself. I don't know. Um, but you think that maybe God can't use you or that, you know, you're just not going to be good enough. Well, this is what I want to say. Ruth didn't think that she was good enough. People told her she wasn't good enough. But in Ruth 16, where she says, 
Your God is going to be my God. Not good enough Ruth became good enough because God made her good enough. And so it really doesn't matter what other people think. I know it's hard because, uh, please, I, I, people have said things about me all my life. And so it's like, Ugh, okay, maybe I am that. Maybe I'm not that. Maybe I'm not good enough. But you have to listen to the one voice, the one voice, and that's God's voice. And God says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, anyone who believes in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. He gives you the new. You become a new person. Your identity, a new creation, is in Christ. It's not about what all these other people think. It's not about what you been through or what you've done or you might have been the worst person in the world but the second that you allow God to come into your life you become a new creation all that old stuff passes away and he makes you new so Jess is going to come up right now and she's going to show you a little something along those lines Thank you, Shaney. Awesome job. I'm Jess, like she said, Jess Silva. And this is my lovely assistant, <laughs> Sully. You met him before. Um, so we're going to show you an object lesson, which is something we do um, in the kids' ministry quite often. And the kids love it. And it um, sometimes when we ask them, like, what did you learn about? They may not remember, but I hear a lot of parents say, um, tell me what you did, and then you might hear parts uh, and details of the Bible story that they learned. Um, oh, I wanted to invite any kids that wanted to come closer to tell you that you can come sit down on the floor. and sit on the floor, sit on the floor. Um, and we will make sure that you make it safely back to your parents. So anyone that wants to come close with your friends, we're not exploding anything today, so you can come close. <laughs> sadly. Okay, so these containers, they represent three different people. So this container over here, that's us. Sorry, I just... <laughs> Focus. Do it again. These... <laughs> the clear container represents us. Yes. And the, uh, the one in the middle, it represents sin. So sin can be kind of dark in our lives or something that we want to hide from or not, not talk about. And then lastly, this container represents Jesus, God, our relationship with him. Um, so sin is what pulls us away from God, can keep us separate from God, and what tarnishes us. So when we sin... Uh, when we believe what others say about us or believe our identity is in the things of this world, we allow sin to enter into our lives and it can um, tarnish us. It can make us feel less than pure. It can make us feel um, like we're not good enough. Um, sin can overtake us sometimes. But for those who believe in Jesus, his sacrifice that he paid for us, hope is not lost. Amen. When we ask for forgiveness, our sins can be washed clean. So what do you do? <laughs> so see, we got Jesus in our lives, and our sins can be washed clean. <laughs> um, often we feel these times of cleansing. We feel Jesus' presence in our lives, and, um, and we still can turn back to our sin, or we can turn to new sins and experience that darkness again. But once we have Jesus's love and we accept his sacrifice that he made for us, those sins can no longer separate us from him. <laughs> he will always take us back if we fall back into our pattern of sin. We can ask for his grace and forgiveness and turn from our old ways. Ruth could have believed that she was not worthy of God's love. She could have chosen to believe what others said about her. But instead, she made the hard choice to follow a God that wasn't her. She made the hard choice to follow the one true God. And not even realizing that when she did that, her future could be greater than anything she had imagined for her life. Amen.
Thank you. You guys can go back to your seats. Thank you. takes it all away. <laughs> He's still Jesus. You're right. So I have one more challenge for you. The first challenge is, is if you're feeling defeated or maybe you've never come to know the Lord. Jesus is waiting. He's there for you. He's speaking life into you. So our second challenge is to be a Boaz. If you have Jesus in your life, you need to be a Boaz. You need to speak life into others. I'm going to tell you a little story about my daughter, Justina. Um, she's my oldest daughter. She uh, was diagnosed with a learning uh, disability when she was in kindergarten. And uh, she had dyslexia, had a really, really difficult time um, being able to read, and uh, math was uh, difficult for her as well. Um, she had also some auditory processing things. Um, and in fourth grade, she had a teacher that um, called her stupid on a regular basis. And it, uh, it's one thing when a child calls you that, when, when a peer calls you that, but when a teacher, when an adult calls you that, it, it really, really um, affected her. Um, she stopped doing all of her therapies, and she's like, this is just it. I'm done. Um, and in sixth grade, God gave her a different teacher, Mrs. Bellwood. I'll give her a shout out. You all don't know her, but she was um, a wonderful teacher who actually, sixth grade was probably one of the hardest years for Justina. Um, first middle school, it's a little awkward, and um, she had a difficult time with friends. Um, she just felt defeated, let's just put it that way. She was, she was down and low and believing all these things that other people were saying about her. And her teacher saw this, and she's like, I told, came to me and said, I've done everything I can with friends. Like, you can't make kids be friends and be good, be nice. Um, but, you know, the way that Justina handled it was amazing. So she gave her this award and called her out in front of all of her friends and gave her, I think it was called the Christian Character Resilience Award, and basically said, you know, I've seen you and I've seen how you've gone through all of these things this year. You're an amazing person. You're an amazing child of God. I love you. God loves you. He sees you. And it wasn't an immediate change. It was one of the stepping stones for her. Um, Throughout her high school years, she struggled with school, but um, she just graduated with her associate's degree um, a few months ago, and she had straight A's um, in college, which, like I said, so proud of her, but, like, she never thought, it was so funny, because she called me, she goes, did, did you know what this cord meant? I didn't even know. Like, I had this red cord, and I didn't even know I had straight A's. Like, I had a 4.0 GPA, so... I was like, yeah, because you know what? You let God use you. You said, I'm not going to believe these things. But it's because she had people in her life who spoke God's truth. So my challenge is to you, be a Boaz. Teachers, be a Boaz. My ministry leaders, all of you that work with the kids that volunteer week after week, be a Boaz to them. They might not hear it every day that they go to school. But if they can come to church on a Sunday morning and they can hear how they are loved just the way they are, they need to hear that. Um, one of the really cool things is how God ended up using Ruth. So in Matthew 1, verse 5, kind of give, if you know about anything about Matthew in the beginning, it's kind of giving the, the order of the lineage of Jesus. So it says, Salmon was the father of Boaz, Rahab, all y'all out there in kids' ministry, we learned about Rahab a few weeks ago. Might explain why Boaz was so sweet and tender to Ruth. Rahab was Boaz's mother. Boaz was the father of Obed. Ruth was Obed's mother. And Obed was the father of Jesse. So we're going to skip a few verses and go down to verse 16. Jacob was the father of Joseph. Joseph was the husband of Mary, and Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Christ. So God used Ruth, who was 
a foreigner, a widow, poor, didn't think much of herself. Other people didn't think much of her, but God thought a lot of her. Because if you look in the lineage, there's only a few women named in the Bible about, that are in that list. And she gets to be one of them. So he thought very highly of her. The other thing is, God's not really mentioned in the book of Ruth. But man, you can see his work, his hand in all of it. So maybe you're out there and you don't see God working in your life right now. He's there. He's doing it. He's there for you. So we are going to take a minute. And I want to have all of my prayer team come up um, and the worship team come back up. And if you are feeling this morning like you need some prayer, you need to give your life to God, you need to become this new creation, I would encourage you, come now. This is the time. Don't put it off. Someone can pray with you or you can pray right there in your seat. The other thing is, if you need some prayer because you just are feeling like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I, I feel so defeated. Then let us speak some truth into you. Let us pray over you. So take this time for prayer.